Howdy and welcome to Burley United Methodist Church's worship service for Sunday, November 14th. We are so glad you could tune in. Uh, last Sunday, we had a very successful uh, charge conference. We are very grateful for uh, uh, Reverend Gay Jeffries for coming and uh, via the Zoom and uh, giving her uh, intake, uh, insights, uh, of our church. Uh, we are very grateful for that. Next Sunday, uh, Staff Parish Relations Committee meeting will be uh, meeting with me and with our uh, district superintendent, uh, Karen Hernandez. We have come to worship. God calls us to, to pray, to read, to be together. Even in this time of COVID, we can be together as much as we can. So our opening hymn this morning is How Firm a Foundation. The call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 82. I'll read the light print. I'll ask you to respond in the bold. The sovereign God of all nations summons us. All of us are offspring of the most high God. As children of the eternal one, we seek realities that are yet unseen. God calls us away from speculation to life's realities. People are suffering and dying for their faith. Some are persecuted and betrayed. Some are delivered up and imprisoned. For many, the foundations of life are shaken and there is no justice or hope to be seen. We come to hear from the divine counsel that we might rise up on the healing wings of God. Please join me in prayer. God of all right and justice, speak to us in ways we cannot ignore, lest we be led astray by other voices. Enlist us in meaningful work among the least of your children. Keep us from unproductive idleness that ignores the tasks, small or large, you intend for us to do. Strengthen our ties with parents and children that we might grow in understanding and mutual support. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is Nearer, My God to Thee.
As we come in prayer, I am reminded that when I was an instructor in the army, I told my students, you get out of it what you put into it. And, 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 and prayer is no different. If we give lip service to God, should we surprise that our prayers are hard to figure out if they are being, even being answered or not? But prayer is hard work, and it is worth it if we come and do what is right. Please join me as we come to grow together in prayer. Heal us, O God, and make us whole. Make our cities and towns and nation. Fill them with servants that come and do what is best for their people. May everywhere we go be filled with grace and not gossip. Heal our churches, O oh God. That even though we might disagree on the small stuff, the important stuff, we are like-minded. Oh God, heal us because your people have become accustomed to war and tolerance of violence in our streets and in our homes. Heal us, oh God. Your children are hungry and cannot find shelter while their brothers and sisters live and seek and sleep in the lap of luxury. Heal us, O oh God. That we feel our brothers and sisters are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Heal us, O oh God, for those who are felled by disease or suffer anxieties. that they may have, that they may feel your healing hand upon them. Oh God, we are so very grateful for you are trustworthy. Thank you for hearing our prayers and calming our fears and bringing us ever nearer to your kingdom of peace and justice for all. For we give all thanks and praise now and forever in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught his disciples when they prayed to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'll share with you a story about an unfortunate hiker, for he found himself in the middle of nowhere. His water had long been consumed, and seeing no possibility of rescue or survival, he was very despondent. And as he went over a small rise, he saw something ahead of him. So he changed his direction. And soon he found an old hand crank that you would normally find at a well. So he started to crank the handle up and down feverishly. But all he heard was rusty pieces of metal rubbing against each other. The board he was standing on suddenly slipped a little, and beneath it, he saw this note. Dear fellow traveler, you have found a well, 
that will take care of the thirsts of everyone in your party. There is a jar of water under the nearest rock that you must pour down the shaft of the pump slowly to moisten the leather and then pour the second half of the water from the jar quickly. Once the pump is primed, the water will only stop once after you have pumped, stopped pumping. Do not drink the water in the jar. And when you are done, fill this jar up again and place it under the rock for the next fellow traveler as the last person did for you. And place this note back where you found it. Remember, point, pour the first half of the water slowly to loosen up the leather and then pour the other half quickly and start pumping. Enjoy. Signed, Desert Pete. What would you do if you found yourself in that situation and found that note and found that jar of water? Would you drink it? Or would you take Desert Pete's words to heart and believe? This is an all or nothing scenario. There is no plan B. Actually, if I had to write an autobiography, my autobiography, it would be entitled Plan B. If you find yourself in a situation where one fork on the road it takes you to the result that is great, and the other fork takes you to the result what is amazing, there's really not a quandary. Both are good, but that is not normally how life comes to us. The big decisions in our lives can be divided between risk and reward. That's what Cactus Pete offers down for everyone over 21 down at Jackpot. If you watch the wide world of sports decades ago on Saturday afternoons on ABC, you always heard these words, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Frequently, our life's situation is between every day either living between an amazing or a mess. There was a widow that lived in Sidon, modern day Lebanon. And in 1 Kings 17, she crosses a path with a stranger and his name was Elijah. He had been living by a small river and it had dried up and so he had ventured looking for water. We all know that if you don't have enough water, you soon find yourself without a lot of things including food. Elijah asked this woman for some bread and water, and she confessed that all she had at her home was a small amount of flour and a little oil. She told Elijah that what she had planned to prepare was for her and her son, and then they would wait and die. Life was painted, life had painted this woman and her son into a corner and there was no way out. She had no plan B. And Elijah said to the woman, do not be afraid. If I was that widow, I would want to throw something at him, but I didn't have anything. I was that poor. Are you kidding me? My future just has one page left in it, and fear is all I have. Go home, Elijah said, and do as you have as do as you have been told, but first make me a small cake and bring it to me, and then you can take care of yourself and your boy. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, 
The jar of meal will not be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail until the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And it happened. Just as Elijah said, the widow's dry goods never ran out because not Elijah, but because God said so. And we come across a similar story in the New Testament. It's the only miracle that is found in each of the four Gospels. Even Jesus' birth narrative, the story of Christmas, is only found in Matthew and Luke, but this miracle is found in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. I want you to begin to get ready to immerse yourself into the story by framing what you are doing when you hear the question, what would you have done? But I want to bring you out of that story also to modern day, early 2021, and have you answer the second question. What will you do the next time you face the impossible? If you brought your Bibles with you, please open to the Gospel of John chapter 6. By this time in John's Gospel, Jesus' popularity is off the charts. People everywhere want to get a look at this preacher from Nazareth. In John chapter 5, he had an altercation with the religious elite out of Jerusalem, and he rebuffed them. John chapter 6. And after this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd followed, kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. The crowd was impressed with the things, the signs, the miracles that Jesus had done, these healings of people who had diseases and illnesses. Jesus went up to the mountain and he sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival, the Jews was near and they looked up and he saw a large crowd coming toward him. And he said to Philip, where are you, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? Jesus said this to Philip to test him. For he himself, he knew what he was going to do. Philip had to answer Jesus. It would take us six months of wages to cater a meal for all of these people. We don't have that kind of money. Well, that's not the way you talk to the boss. You give the boss options. You don't restate the problem. But Philip calls a friend. One of his disciples, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Andrew had a solution, but its feasibility was questionable. And then Jesus takes over the conversation. And Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. And then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. And when the people saw the sign that they had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. And when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force and to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. It doesn't matter where you are or what fiasco is heading your way. Big problems require personal responses. 
Maslow's hierarchy of needs tells us that food and water and sleep and a safe place to find rest are basic. When those needs are not met due to natural disaster like happened in Haiti or disease or lack of finances, the results of homelessness and kids not learning in school because they have so many issues at home come to roost. First, the crowds had seen that Jesus has healed the sick. Doctors, surgeons, who can, with the help of their staffs and drugs, able to offer good health to those who were very ill. And these MDs are in very high demand, just as Jesus was. Well, we have Mayo clinics and cancer treatment centers all over the U.S. There was only one Jesus. And it's not surprising that 5,000 plus were captivated, pursuing him relentlessly, hoping that someone in their family could be healed by this preacher, for their needs seemed endless. John left out a detail from Mark's rendition of the story. We read in Mark 6 that Jesus saw the crowd and he had compassion on them, for they, he looked at them as a flock of sheep who had no shepherd. In John 5, in, John, in verse 5 of John 6, Jesus asked Philip, well, what do you think we should do about this? Philip didn't have a clue. It can't be done. That was Philip's answer. With the resources we have, we can't complete the mission. What situation can you think of where your response would be the same as Philip's? Jesus wants to change our lives by changing the lies. What we see as impossible is possible with him. Would you disagree? Would you agree with this definition of impossible? Something that can't occur or exist or be done. But this is exactly where God interrupts. Impossible is distinctively a human word. I would be willing to bet and put a bet down at Cactus Pete's that the word impossible has never been uttered in heaven. Remember a few weeks ago where the father who came to ask Jesus actually begged Jesus to heal his son? This father had no plan B. It was, that was impossible for him. All there was, was Jesus. And our Lord told the Father, everything is possible for the one who believes. And I have a question, a very important question, and it is, believe in what? When I hear someone who does not know Jesus say to me, we're sending you positive thoughts your way, all I want to do is give them up. Keep your positive thoughts to yourself. Do you believe in luck? Do you believe in good breaks? Or do you believe in the master of the universe who does not utter the word impossible? That's what the story is all about. 5,000 men and probably another 10,000 family members are hungry. I don't know how much food was consumed by last Friday night's football game at the BSU Wyoming game. I don't have a clue, but it would have taken many, many truckloads. Jesus had no trucks coming his way. But Jesus can do the impossible. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, introduced the possible. And my stewardship point this morning is give what you have to God 
and use it for God's glory. Your resources may not be great, but they are enough. And this little boy's lunch may or not, may lunch may be what he was bringing home to his family for dinner that night. And Jesus used his meager resources and performed the amazing miracle of feeding maybe 15,000 people. Five barley loaves and two fish. This is not like the TV episode Wicked Tuna where one fish can, can, can feed a truckload of people. This boy has two fish or probably closer to maybe the size of sardines, not a halibut or a sturgeon or a salmon. A third question. Why do you think Jesus took this boy's fish and bread? Feeding all these people with a few fish and, a, and an arm load of bread is like trying to keep the ocean back with a broom. What were Jesus' actions say? For Jesus makes a serious statement. First, look at the props. In the most impressive miracle of the Gospels, so impressive that each of the four Gospel writers make sure that they have this miracle in their manuscript. And then Jesus, like David in the Old Testament, against Goliath, uses God uses a boy. David brought to the fight the same number of stones as the boy had loaves of barley. What a story this boy would tell when he finally got home that day. Not only did I see this miracle take place, he would say to his family, I took part in it. We can only imagine the impact this miracle had on this little boy when he realized the word impossible is false news. God uses what you have to fill a need you would never have filled. God uses where you are to take you where you could never have gone. God uses who you are to let you become who you could never have been. Can you believe in the impossible? After the meal had taken place, it was now to clean up. Jesus had the disciples gather up in their 12 baskets, everything that had not been eaten. So what's this message, fourth question, what's this message of this leftovers? There's a basket for each of the disciples to hold the remnants, to remind them of the impossible. If this miracle placed a huge impact upon this little boy of how small can turn into big, how much more do you think? They carried that basket full of bread and fish back to Jesus, impacted each of these disciples. They held in their hands the proof of God's provisions. They saw with their own eyes the work of the Savior. There is no hearsay evidence. This is first-hand accounts by 12 men. A little later on in the Gospel of Mark, he wrote about the feeding of the 4,000 and families. And this time, seven loaves of bread and an undisclosed amount of fish. And after each one is done eating, the disciples again gather up the leftovers, one basket for every loaf. And then days or weeks later, the 13 get into a boat and they head across the Sea of Galilee, which is really a lake. And they might have, have been talking up a storm 
about what they had seen recently. And then they realized that no one had bought food for their travel across their long journey. Mark 8, verses 14 through 21. And now the disciples had forgotten to bring any bread. And they only had one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them saying, watch out. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. And they said to one another, it is because we have no bread. And becoming aware of it, Jesus said to them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not perceive or understand? Are, you do, are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of pieces did you collect? And they said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000. And how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? And they said, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Two massive miracles that the 12 were a part of, and still they did not get it. They were still worried about a little boat ride, talking about an adventure that's missing the mark. Please do not read this book like it contains ancient stories. Just don't read the Bible about what God did. Take it in for what you read and begin to think about what God can do in your lives and in this church and in this community. Don't let limited resources, seeing God's part, and how God can use you to play an important role like that boy with the five loaves and two fish. For what an amazing tale you will tell one day. For all we have to do is be available, believe, and give. Let's pray. Loving God, we come to you and we are so very grateful for these wonderful gospel writers to have devoted their lives to sharing these stories that we relish each and every day. Lord, place us in these stories that our lives may be impacted and changed for your kingdom and for your glory. Amen.
Our final hymn this morning is Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Go with the courage of that young boy. Go out and change the world, trusting to God to supply your every need. And may the abundance and the goodness of God and the generous mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ and the sustaining power of the Holy Spirit be with you today, every day, until the coming of of God's joyous kingdom. And all of God's people said, Amen.